Welcome back to Pine and Pint Podcast. And this week we are joined by YouTube sensation Connor O'Keefe, host of the hugely popular YouTube series Keeping Goals and goalkeeper for the Swedish side Peter FC. Let's go on with the video. Well, thank you very much, Connor, for coming on to the podcast. We'll, not uh, at all. Thank you for having me. No, not a problem. But so we'll start right at the beginning of your career. So you're quite a well travelled footballer, gaining quite a lot of different experience in different countries. But starting right at the beginning, what got you into the game and becoming a goalkeeper? Um, I think, like a lot of us, I mean, I, I was born into quite a football crazy family. So uh, my dad, especially my granddad, big Man United fans, season ticket holders all their kind of lives, like lived from the Manchester area. And being born into that family, it was kind of, that was what we did. We were all big United fans. So me and and my brother, who's only 18 months younger than me, from as soon as we could walk, we were playing football inside the house and then outside the house when mum chucked us out. And it worked quite well because he loved shooting and trying to score goals. And I loved diving around in the mud and, and stopping him. So it was uh, that was kind of our childhood, really. We'd spend hours outside at the park, in the garden, in, in the lounge, like I said, and, and just playing between the two of us. Um, and then obviously as I got older, you kind of get into the club system and, and all that kind of stuff happens from there. But the real love for it was diving around in the mud, making saves and, and enjoying playing football with my little brother, really. Yeah. Did you have an icon goalkeeper? Um, Is that yours, Josh? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Oh, yeah, I was, I was thinking you're probably probably a bit young for uh, Schmeichel, aren't you? I bet. I bet. He, he, I pretty. I'm pretty much just just miss Schmeichel. I mean, yeah. Uh, my well, my memories of watching Schmeichel play were for City rather than for United. Oh, so, like watching yeah. watching yeah. when he obviously yeah. played against United later in his career and things. Those were the games I remember watching him play. But listening to my dad and my granddad, obviously, and watching and watching clips, I saw mm. everything he did at United. Um, was it? Uh, I mean, Taibi and Bosnich that were your icons then. <laughs> well, I, I was I kind of slotted in that difficult period. Yeah. And my big icon actually comes mm-hmm. from that. And it's a funny one because my my favourite goalkeeper growing up was Tim Howard at United. Yeah. And um I it's so much so that I used to dislike Roy Carroll extremely because <laughs> he was the one that used to knock him yeah. out of the team. So like I like my favourite number was 14, because that was what Howard wore at United. Mm-hmm. Like I was a massive Tim Howard fan. And uh, I mean, obviously, in his career, he's he's been incredible, and especially with with America and Everton. But even though the United kind of part of his career, people don't really rate that highly. I, I loved watching him play. But then following on from him, Van der Sar, and and yeah. and watching him for the amount of time that he played for United, that that was more as I was older and I could understand the position. I really did appreciate that. But when I was a kid, uh, yeah, Howard Howard was my big one. I'm right there with you, actually, on 18 Roy Cox. When he signed for Derby County, I was fuming. <laughs> Always got to sure be remembered I'm, for that. I'm sure that, he's a lovely guy. Yeah, that amazing that save guy. from Pedro yeah. Mendes. And here's the line, and here's Carol's hand. <laughs> well, I mean, I, pro- I probably loved him that day because he yeah. kept his uh, No, so a few years, uh, well, a few years later when you were sort of growing up, you began your career at Macclesfield at age of... 12 or 13 and sort of progressed through their youth ranks. What was that experience like for a, such a young lad going into that sort of football environment? Well, it was an interesting start really with my career because, I mean, the first proper taste I had of it was a bit earlier when I was 10. I went to Crew Alexandra, which is a big kind of well-known academy in the Northwest, produced a lot of top-class players. And even though the first team kind of bounced between League One, League Two, the, the academy is really well known and it's a high level academy. And and I had a year there and we used to play United, City, Liverpool, Everton every week. And I, I really didn't like it. At 10 years old, I found it really difficult purely just because of the professional approach at that age. I didn't really um, enjoy my football there because... We were training four times a week. It was quite a big trek from where I was living. Um, Like all the things now, which are brilliant as an older player. But at the time, we used to keep like a diary about what we ate. We had to like record, like analyze our sessions, like the training sessions, all that kind of stuff. And and at that point, it kind of grew a bit of a 
dislike for organised football. I felt a lot of pressure, even though I was playing well and they, and they really liked me there. So after a year, I said to my mum and dad, I don't, I don't want to play there anymore. I don't, I don't enjoy it. And I went back and played Sunday league football with my mates, played centre midfield for two years and had a great time and kind of found that love of playing football again. And, and when I got to Macclesfield at 12, that was my like, local team, my, my town where I was living. And um, it, was a, it was an in-between, really. It wasn't obviously the elite academy that Crew was, but it was, a, it was a higher standard and a higher level than, than Sunday league football. And it kind of fit well for me at that point. And if you'd have asked me at 12 or 13 if I wanted to be a footballer, I probably would have said yes, because that's what every lad says, but I probably didn't mean it. It wasn't yeah. something that I was actively thinking about or actively chasing, but um, I enjoy my football. And, and each year that they kind of had choices about who would stay and who would go, I'd, I'd be kept on and kept on and kept on. And suddenly blink and I'm 16 and, and you're going into kind of youth team contracts and things like that. But I went through it all, enjoying playing in goal, enjoying playing football, but not really actively going, that's what I want to do. Yeah. So then a few years later, you was travelling away to Spain. I think you was at Loughborough University because I'm quite a fan anyway of your keeping goals system anyway on, on YouTube. So you travel out to Spain and I think you, you had trials with, is it Rea Bayacano? And then you ended up with Fuenlabrada. Might, mm. might have said that wrong. No, but it's fine. Can you tell us sort of how that come about and everything that you actually had to go through sort of to go and play out there? Yeah, I mean, I w it was kind of, like I said, at 16, I'd been offered a wide team contract at Macclesfield. I enjoyed going to school at the same time. I didn't want to leave school and, and become solely an apprentice. I wanted to do my A-levels as well because I, I enjoyed studying. Yeah. I was very fortunate that Macclesfield let me do that as opposed to a lot of other kids that weren't able to. My school worked really hard to enable me to do full-time with Macclesfield and also in the evenings, in the afternoons, study, do my A-level. So that was kind of where the combination of football and education began for me. Um, I was very fortunate. I got my A-levels. I did, I did very well. got two A's and a B. And I also got a pro contract at Macclesfield. So I kind of balanced the two when, when people didn't think that was possible due to the help of the club and the school and, and my parents and things. And I had a year full-time at Macclesfield as a third-year pro. Never played was on the bench, had some loan moves, but as a young goalkeeper, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people who've been in that position would understand you, you very rarely get games because managers want experience, but yeah. if they don't give you the opportunity, you can't get that experience and it's a bit of a catch-22. So because of my A-level experience, I had an offer from Loughborough due to doing the whole UCAS applications and things and, and my parents encouraged me to go and have a look at it when I wasn't really playing at Macclesfield and I went down to have a look at the programme and for anyone that's been to Loughborough University, um, they'll know. And I know you've chatted to Robbie Sim uh, Simpson as well, who's, yeah. who's alumni of Loughborough and, and a yeah. great guy. Um, and he'll tell you the same. It's an unbelievable university for sport and, and the facilities there. The football programme too, it's as close as you can get to being in a full-time club whilst, whilst studying. We yeah. had strength and conditioning coaches, physios, nutritionists, uh, psychologists, all for a university team. But we were playing... Yeah two, three games a week, non-league, university league. And for me as a young keeper, it was brilliant. I went straight in, played all those games, had nearly a hundred games in, in three years or whatever I was at Loughborough, which for me was exactly what I needed at that age. But part of my degree was the opportunity to have an Erasmus year and to, and to study abroad. And once I did that, I kind of had a look at where the links were with the university. They had a university in Madrid that they were linked with. I'd always watched Spanish football growing up with like Revista de la Liga on Sky and and, yeah. and like I was a big fan of Casillas and, and Valdez and, and those keepers and thought it'd be a great opportunity to obviously study abroad and, and live in a different country, but play my football in a different country too and, and develop myself as a player from that point of view. So I went over to Spain. I didn't have an agent at the time, didn't speak Spanish, but me and my girlfriend who fortunately did speak Spanish, built up a bit of a database of clubs in the Madrid area. Um, I got all the contact details off Google, kind of managers' names, email addresses, phone numbers. And I wrote letters to each and every single club from Real Madrid down to like ninth tier, nobody. And um, 
wrote it out in Spanish with the help of my girlfriend, sent them in golden envelopes so that people would open them as opposed to just chucking them in the bin and, and things like that. And as a result, managed to get pre-season with Rayo Baicano, who a big club in Madrid, they, they bounced between La Liga and, and the second division. Um, did pre-season with their kind of B team, they, the under 23s. And at the end of that, was offered an opportunity with Fuenlabrada as, as their third choice keeper, who were full time. They're in the third tier, and um, it was kind of a flashback to my A level days. I would train with them in the morning, um, kind of develop my game from an English kind of non league, lower league goalkeeper to someone that's expected to keep up in Spanish rondos and Spanish possessions. So that was a big change. Um, and then in the afternoons, head to the university, do my lectures, do my work, and, and that kind of thing. But it was an incredible year, learning the language, learning the culture, but a huge development in my game as a goalkeeper too. So it was, uh, it was extremely valuable and I even got a nice trip to Real Madrid in the Copa del Rey as well, home and away, part of the squad, which was unbelievable. Um, Bale was playing, Zidane was manager, Kayla Navas, all those people. So it, was, uh, it wasn't your regular study abroad year, but it was a, it was a very, very good one for, for my career. Can I just ask Connor to? That's, I mean, that's an incredible story, first and foremost. I mean, the effort you've gone to, golden envelopes and everything, that's just. It's magical, it's like really. Deep, it really it's is. Good, yeah. But just on the flip, what just. I, I was thinking the whole time you were talking, really, what was the contingency, if you, if you will? Um, if, you, if you hadn't pers- pursued football, obviously you were studying at Loughborough, you got yeah. your degree. What was your thoughts? Was it like a sports science degree? or? I think it's, it's interesting because, again, my career has been so different and so kind of unconventional yeah. that the year where I had the pro contract and I was full-time at Macclesfield was probably the year where I gave the least to becoming a pro. I would turn up to training, do what I was expected to do, and then go home. And that was it. And a lot, of, a lot of players will say the same. It wasn't that I thought, oh, I've made it. It wasn't that I was big-headed. It was just that that's what I did. And, and, and yeah. that's all I kind of knew. And as soon as I came out of that, I suddenly had the fire where I knew I should have done more. And I knew I should have been working harder. I knew I should have been coming back in the afternoons. I knew I should have been working on my weak foot. And... I knew that I would really regret it if I didn't do everything in order to get back there and, and beyond. So as soon as I went to Loughborough, I'm probably the first person in history that went to university to try and become a footballer. But as soon as I went to Loughborough, that was all I was focused on. I wanted to use all the facilities, all the knowledge, all the coaches to maximise my development and maximise my mindset to try and get back to where I thought I wanted to be. And I never really thought what I was going to do apart from being a footballer. And that was the first time that that switch hit. It's not, it wasn't when most people happen where it's 15, 16. For me, it was 19 when I'd had that chance and that I didn't do it properly. I suddenly thought, right, this is what I want to do. And now I know what I should be doing. And ever since then, like you talk about keeping goals, I'm sure people that watch it will, will understand now the approach that I have to football, but that wasn't something I always had. It's something that I had to learn almost the hard way. Yeah. And I did throughout my time at Loughborough and throughout my time in Spain, that was all I was focused on. Obviously, I wanted to get the degree. It was important for me to keep studying. I was doing an international business degree. I've always been interested in business. But at the same time, the focus was on getting back to playing at the highest level I possibly could. That's brilliant. It is. I know we've touched on it. You said, <clears throat> obviously, getting drawn against Real Madrid. I know, obviously, the first game you'd, the guys drew 2-2 two, two, and then obviously you travelled with the guys to the Bernabeu and you was on the pitch and everything. What was that actual atmosphere like then, obviously, from where you've been in your career to then being sort of there, obviously, as part of the third-choice goalkeeper at mm. the club? What was that like? It was... It showed me that it wasn't as far away as people think it is. So, I mean to be Kayla Navas and win three Champions Leagues in a row is a bit more of a stretch than drawing them in the <laughs> cup and playing in the game. But at the same time, the keepers that I was with were, were incredible. I was obviously the younger keeper, but it showed me that it, it's, not, it's not a different world. It's not somewhere that isn't attainable. And if you were to put in the right work, you could get there. And 
the first leg, I mean, it's a bit unfortunate that it's not like the FA Cup because the first leg, we unfortunately, we lost the first leg 2-0. Two, two very questionable penalty decisions, which I'm sure mm. had nothing to do with the fact that we play in Real Madrid. And then the second, <laughs> the second game, we drew 2-2 two, two at the Bernabeu, which was unbelievable. And I mean, my mum was there, my, my brother, my, my girlfriend and my granddad, right up in the gods in the Bernabeu. And, and for me, I was obviously wasn't playing, but like you say, to to be on the pitch before the game, to be part of the travelling squad, to to have like my family there seeing it and all that kind of stuff. It, it really justified the decision that I made to go again and to try again and to try and do it better than the last time. And it showed me that I was, I was going about it the right way. So it was almost affirmation for my work, but at the same time, a, a night where you just smile and enjoy it because it, it doesn't happen very often. No, yeah, that's, that's class to say you re really focus on your career at sort of 19 and then to be where you were there. Mm. I bet not many people can say that they've been, <laughs> they've been in sort of your shoes, so that's incredible. But I know you like to oh, sort of pride oh. yourself. Oh, go on, sorry, Josh. No, I was just going to say how you're saying it, it makes it feel like they're not, like it's not a million miles away. I suppose it makes them people real as well. Like you see Gareth Bale, mm. you see Zidane on the telly. You, you think, you know, I mean, they're not really real people, are they? They're just these superstars that you never see. But, but to be on the team against them at, at such a young age, like you say, it must really make you think, yeah, I, I can do yeah, this. And it, sh it, shows you the, it shows you the top, top players because Bale was on the bench to begin with and we went 1-0 up. And then he went out to warm up, got brought on, and he'd assisted a goal within three touches. Mm. He was a joke, like un unreal. And I mean, you're playing against players that are the best in the world anyway. But then when someone else, someone comes on and stands out above that, you're like, wow, okay. And that shows you what the top, top, top players are like. But um, yeah, like you say, it was, I mean, when we first arrived, the guy that opened the door to us as we came into the stadium was Raul. And you look at that and you're like, oh my days. <laughs> you're like, this is gonna be one of those one of those nights. Is he so like an like, ambassador he, there or something? Or? Yeah, yeah, he was the oh, ambassador. Wow. Like he's just doorman Luke. We've got uh Morientes somewhere and all. <laughs> <laughs> so no, unreal, unreal. Salgado <laughs> serving burgers in Cardi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, brilliant. So we're uh, how did you find your development out in Spain? So uh, everything's, I know you said actually in your videos about everything's on the pitch, sort of mm. using both feet mm. and everything in England was very like gym based, physical. How did you find sort of the difference? I, I mean, it's only from obviously my perspective because I haven't been at a Man United or, or a Man oh, yeah. City, but from probably a lower league Spanish team <clears throat> and a lower league British team, the focus in Spain was hugely on the technical side. So like you said, we rarely did work in the gym. We probably did about an hour in the gym in total as a team. I mean, obviously, personally, you could do more if you wanted to. But as a group, we were rarely in the gym. We were always on the pitch. And the focus on the pitch was always technical from a goalkeeping perspective, but from a playing perspective. The rondos, the clubs I've been involved with, a lot of people don't take rondos seriously. It's a chance to nutmeg your mate and stitch people mm -hmm. up and, and all that kind of stuff. But in Spain, as soon as you're in the rondos, it started. And if you're messing up, you know about it. And there's some serious judgment going on if you're not keeping up. So the, the, the focus is a lot more on the technical side. But for me as a goalkeeper, it's great because, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the tallest goalkeeper so growing up in the UK, I, I focused a lot on my speed, a lot on my athleticism. Um, and as soon as I went to Spain, I'd see these keepers, these keepers kind of ambling in exercises. And, and you've probably seen Spanish keepers, like very laid back, very chilled. And I was like, I'm going to go in, I'm going to blast them. I'm going to be so fast. I'm going to be lightning. They're not going to keep up with me. And I would, but then the keeper coach would be like, yeah, it's great. You can do that. But then your positioning is not quite there because you're rushing it or your hands are slightly wrong because you're rushing it. Is like if we can combine the two, you're going to be a hell of a keeper. So almost from my development, it was about really focusing on the technical side, my positioning, my handling, my distribution, and adding that into my game alongside the stuff that I learned in lower league English football. So um, yeah, it was a great opportunity to develop personally. Do you find it difficult, or Connor? Obviously, moving 
moving to to Spain. I'm guessing mm. a lot of coaches <laughs> coached in Spanish. Um, obviously, you had you had quite a you, you were at uni and things like that anyway, mm. so so you were used to that sort of learning and environment like that. But, but yeah, how how was that? Was that do you feel like it was a pressure to to, the to first, learn quickly? Yeah, the first the first time the first time I was there, I spoke zero Spanish. I don't, yeah. Like I said, my, my girlfriend spoke Spanish and, and she was amazing in helping me to learn. But I was like Duolingo learning how to say hello. That was kind of the level I was yeah. at. And um, and it was almost a sink or swim because no one really spoke English. I was mm-hmm. looking back, I was very fortunate that both clubs, the only staff member that really spoke English was the goalkeeper coach, right. which meant that I could have a lot more kind of conversation with them and they could understand me personally. But from other players to management, it was all Spanish, like instructions to the team, all Spanish. So you had to learn quick. And it almost forced me to because no one else was giving me the opportunity. Compare it to, I'm sure we'll touch on it later, but comparing to coming to Sweden, my first few months in Sweden, everyone's English was incredible. Every player, every person on the street, unbelievable English. So almost, I, I barely learned five words in the first yeah. month because everyone was so good with me in English. But in Spain, I had to learn like that and it did force me to kind of develop that language. But the first the first month or so were diff- was difficult because I, I wasn't brave enough to try. I was, I was really kind of self-conscious. But once you get over that hurdle and you find making mistakes, you, you learn quite quickly. Yeah, I, th- I think you, that's quite heightened with, with Gareth Bale as an example, isn't it? He's yeah. almost was yeah. ridiculed and, and cast out by, mm. by a lot of the fans because he didn't even make the effort. I think like you so yeah. get over that hurdle and they sort of say, look, he's a young English guy. He's making the effort. Let's, mm. let's go with him. That's it. So after this, you did come back home and played with Loughborough where you was really enjoying your football. And then you went out and had some trials at Sweden, uh, mm. where you are now. But mm. how did them trials go and what was it like as sort of trying to get into the game and with the team? It was interesting because I'd had the year in Spain. It had gone so well. I really enjoyed it. I would have loved to have stayed, but I had the final year of Loughborough to do and it felt wrong to kind of stop with a year to go like I'd done three years out of four and and it felt it, it wasn't possible unfortunately to do a distance learning which is what I wanted to do but I came back had my final year at Loughborough really enjoyed it playing for Loughborough that kind of last year and this the latter half of my final year I knew that I had to try and find somewhere to go back into football when I finished because I didn't have the safety net of studying I, I would have had to now it's about making sure that you're not only playing football full-time but it's a good enough level where you can live because <laughs> yeah. if that's what you want to do, you need to be able to support yourself, my girlfriend, whoever. So it was about trying to find that opportunity, which is really difficult. Everyone you'll have spoken to will have been in that position, yeah. be that in the UK or, or abroad. And I went and had some trials in Sweden. I had a trial with a team in Stockholm and it, it went well. I, I enjoyed it and, and they were keen to get me on board, but their season started in April and my degree wouldn't finish until the June. So it didn't kind of work logistically in terms of timing. Um, but that first time that I came, yeah, very cold, very snowy and, and almost a sign of things to come later on, later down the line. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So, uh, and then obviously you had the seasons out in Gibraltar in the Premier mm-hmm. League. And I, I believe is it the top team can play in the Champions League if they win, the second and third go in the Europa League and, and whatnot. So you was with Europoint FC and Bruno's Magpies. What attracted you to go and play out in Gibraltar? Like, I mean, like I say, that summer when I finished my degree, everything was done. I kind of, not naively, but almost expected because of what I'd done in Spain that I'd have the opportunity then to go in at the same level or higher, be that in Spain or somewhere else. And it just didn't come. I was doing exactly the same as what I did, but there just wasn't anything there. The club that I was with had got promoted to the second tier. When Labrada went up to the second tier, suddenly they're bringing in big players and the opportunity for me wasn't there anymore. And it was kind of almost like, oh, right, what do I do? And then suddenly the opportunity to go to Gibraltar came up. And I'd never, I'd never been to Gibraltar. I hadn't really, the only experience I'd seen at Gibraltar was probably the national team not doing that great against Scotland or whoever, never even looked at it. And 
I got approached by the guys who were with Europa Point and they said, listen, there's only 12 teams in the league this year. Three of them get an opportunity to play Europa League or Champions League. And I was like, well, one, one in four, I'll, mm. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give it a go. Yeah. So I, I kind of went out to Gibraltar. I'd had the benefit of obviously being in Spain, speaking Spanish. So now I, I, I found it a lot easier. I think if some people go to Gibraltar and play and if they're in a Spanish speaking team, it's really difficult but I could speak Spanish with the Spanish lads. I could speak English with the English lads or the Gibraltarians or whoever. And um, I kind of saw it as like a really good chance to try and get into the European leagues and almost try and boost myself further that way. I think what I didn't expect was the, the kind of vast difference in the Gibraltar National League between a top, top team and a bottom team because your top team in Gibraltar, they're in Europe every year. They've got good money, but they've got lads that have played at a good level. So they, they almost pay, they pay more than the local Spanish teams. So you'll get the best Spanish lads and you'll get lads who have played f- football league. Um, you've got lads who play higher up in Spain or whoever. The bottom teams in Gibraltar would struggle to compete against most of our non-league teams or even lower. Like It's just groups of mates normally like not getting paid anything, just that's the vastness in one league. Yeah. So it's not uncommon that you'll see in Gibraltar a 13 nil scoreline or something like that. Yeah. So okay. like the, the top f- team get like, uh, uh, there's been a few players, aren't there, who've moved over there in the like mid thirties who like established league two, league one players off the top of my head. Yeah. I'm struggling to think now, but I've definitely seen that. And obviously yeah, no. like the Gibraltar national team somehow as well. Yeah, like Danny I mean, Egan to me went there, didn't he? I think Danny. Egan. <laughs> yeah, Liam, Liam Walker. Liam yeah. Walker played for Portsmouth, Notts County. He's captain of Europa there. I think he plays for the national team. You, I mean, you've got some decent players in the top teams, but then they come against these lads who basically just amateur teams, mm. and it, it's a really difficult task. So, I mean, the team that I went to first, Europa Point, they'd started from zero. They had no players, no management, nothing. And they tried to bring in these lads from different countries around the world. And we, we gave as good as we had, but in, in the end, you just couldn't compete with a team that had like that. And fortunately for me as a goalkeeper, it meant I was super busy in almost every game against top teams. Yeah. We had one game against Europa who ended up winning the league. Well, we finished top of the league when it was, when it was suspended, but we lost one nil. And obviously I'm fuming with loss, come off the pitch Everyone in Europa Point is going mad. The the owner like one nil, unbelievable, like yeah. unbelievable. One, they said last game they played them, they lost thirteen nil. So they were going <laughs> berserk. For me, like I'm I'm fuming. We've lost the game, yeah. and then it, it's, it was a very weird kind of situation. But that first part of the year, because we were under a lot of pressure, it gave me the opportunity to kind of do as well as I could, and we had some good players. So in the January. Uh, it got to kind of like the January transfer window and, and we were we were outside the top six. The league split at Christmas into a six and a six. And if you weren't in the top six, I think we were eighth at the time or something like that, you you wouldn't then compete for the European space uh, places. So in the January, Bruno's Magpies came and, and they said that they were interested in me going and joining them. They were in the top six at that point. And... I decided to go because it was what I wanted to do to try and achieve those European spots. And I'd only played the first four games of the second half of the season when, when COVID hit and suspended the league and, and everything was cancelled. Um, I think we were fifth at the time and it was, it was a difficult year. I mean, I made a lot of really good friends. I really enjoyed it. It was an incredible place to roll to. People are great. And the football was, was really interesting for me to experience almost my first job as a number one even though it was in Gibraltar as a number one and, and playing every week and and trying to compete for those proper places in football um but it was uh it was a it was definitely an interesting year in that sense yeah definitely so moving on now to you being with Peter FC and you've just signed another deal with them obviously while well, you're back out in Sweden now <laughs> but Last season, you won the league. What what a feeling is that? Obviously, the success that you've just had at this, the club that you've been with for the last year. I mean, again, because 
like I said, because it was a difficult year with the with the league getting stopped because of COVID and, and everything kind of grind into a halt. It felt it felt like we hadn't, especially at Bruno's, because we'd only had the four games. We never really gelled. It felt like the season had been cut short before we had a chance to really get going. And I felt that from a personal point of view. I felt I'd enjoyed that first six months at Europa Point. It was a good team, played well. And then the second half, it just never really got going. I came back to the UK. We had the lockdown. And I kind of saw it as this is a great opportunity for me to kind of keep my development going when others from De Gea down to non-league footballers are in the same position and, and might be standing still. Yeah. Everyone for the first time almost in my life had the same resources, the same kind of opportunity to train Yeah, because everyone was on their own. Yeah. yeah. So I saw it as a really good chance to keep going and to keep that momentum and to try and almost catch up with the people that I wanted to be at the same level as. So I did a lot of training during lockdown at home um, I was fortunate that my brother was with me. He was working from home. So I dragged him out on an evening or, or, or weekend and we'd go back to the, the old school days and, of training together. And I was, I was struggling to see where the, the opportunity to play would come because obviously the Premier League was back and, and, and the top leagues. But Gibraltar hadn't started again. Lower leagues in, in the UK hadn't started again. But Scandinavia was still going because of the approach that Sweden took to COVID with not having the lockdown, mm -hmm. the football was still going. And I was contacted by uh, an agent that I'd been in contact with asking for opportunities, saying that there was a chance to go and play in Sweden. Petia needed a goalkeeper. And so it happened quite quickly, but I managed to get out in the summer with almost the last kind of, I think it was 11 games of the season still to be played. And it was amazing because it was almost going back in time to pre-COVID. Everything was still going. Everything was up, like training was happening. And I kind of went in and from the start was flying because of the training that I'd done those months previous. Yeah. And, and it was a great team. I mean, I enjoyed that kind of 11 games more than almost any other kind of time that I'd had yeah. in football. The, the team that we had, the club, the management, everything just clicked. It, it was one of those few places I'm sure people you speak to, everyone got on. There was no little clicks. There was no issues. The training was brilliant. We had great players. And because it was a shortened season, it was almost like everyone's game, everyone's opportunity to win the league. And we put together a run where I think we were not expected to win the league at all. I think in the beginning of the season, they, they predicted we'd be down the bottom. But we ended up just keeping clean sheet after clean sheet after clean sheet, beating the top teams away. And, and by the end of it, ended up winning the league and getting promoted to the third tier in Sweden. So it was a great run in. And um, I can only say it was just the, the team, kind of everything came together at the right stage. And I really enjoyed it as a result. Mm. Seeing the uh, the pictures and things like that, when, when you're celebrating the promotion, everyone's got the gold hats on and things like that. It just looks like a really great, team spirit and I know, like, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd not seen the gold hats before that wasn't something that I'd like <laughs> understood but apparently it's a big Swedish thing I was expecting the kind of classic like medals and trophy and all that kind of stuff but it was just the gold hats and everyone seemed more pleased with the gold hats than anything else so <laughs> I, I think you look in most of the pictures I'm the only one that hasn't got a gold hat yeah, on we didn't know it's not really. I've got an it's not because I don't like them. It's because I've got an abnormally big head and it didn't fit inside, <laughs> it didn't fit inside the golden hat. So I didn't just want it perched on the top. <laughs> you can imagine though, can't you? Like people who's won trophies, of hanging all the medals up and then you're there kind of with a golden hat on your wall. Over <laughs> to be <laughs> fair, isn't it? I, kept, I kept one and I kept it on the mantelpiece. So that, so I've got my gold hat. Right, really. <laughs> and just to touch on, on Peter, is that, so I, I, I'll confess, I don't know a lot about Peter's history. Is, no. is this like the highest? They've, is this the highest they've been? Is, are, are they what? What are they historically? Sort of what's their level? Peter, interestingly, are more in football, more well known for the women's team. So the women play in the Swedish Premier League. So the women are like a very high level team. They they won the league in 2018 played Champions League as a result. Okay. So the women's right. team are, are, are a big team in Sweden. Yeah. But the, men, the men's team have always kind of been in around fourth tier, third tier, fourth tier, third tier. Mm -hmm. So I think the last time that they were in the third tier was, I think 
around 2017, something like that. Um, but with the promotion, obviously, we've gone back into the third tier. The difficult thing in Sweden is Division 2, so the fourth tier, which we won last year, is regionalised. So there's eight leagues across Sweden that play at Division 2 level. When you get to Division 1 or the third tier, it's split into north and south. And yeah. Pitya, if you look on a map, is very far north, like right up the top of Sweden. The majority of teams in the northern division of, of Division 3 are around Stockholm. So you've got, if you were in a car, it'd be a 10-hour journey to an yes. away game. Yeah. Like, it's, it's a massive country. Mm. We're fortunate, I think, that this year, I mean, COVID permitting, touch wood, we'll be able to fly to a lot of the games and things like that. But the travel is very difficult. So in, in previous years, I think teams have struggled going from Division 2 to Division 1 because of that yeah. extreme amount of travelling. But I think this year, given the team that we had last year, the form that we were in, kind of the additions that have been made in this off season. I'm really looking forward to obviously for myself competing at that level and testing myself, but also for showing what, what we can do. Cause I think last year people wrote us off a little bit and we proved it wrong. And I think this year could be something quite similar. So I'm, I'm really excited for it. Yeah. I wonder really. if you've got quite a big catchment area then Connor, cause if you're kind of isolated right at the North or tip of Sweden, mm. I don't know. Yeah. It, what's the fan base like? I just wonder if it's, if they've got yeah. no other clubs around them of you know of a similar level, obviously I'm assuming there's larger clubs potentially around you. But still. we have we have two clubs kind of within an hour and a half that are bigger teams that yeah. traditionally have been higher up in the leagues. The town itself is very is pretty small. It's like Macclesfield. It's not not a big town, yeah. and due to historically the women's team doing so well, a lot of people are more invested on the women's team than they are. Mm with the men's team. So I think what's been really good is the women's team staying in the, in the Premier League last year and, and for us getting promoted, it's bringing about a bit more of people getting involved on both sides and supporting both clubs. Because it, it's amazing for me because women's football in Sweden is brilliant. Like every, I'm, and both clubs that I've been at, so Peter and the club that I was training with a couple of years back when I was on trial, you see the women's and the girls teams training just as often as the men's. Yeah. And it's amazing to see it's from the UK, obviously the, the women's game is growing, yeah. but to see the strength of it, especially in PTO is brilliant. And it's a great opportunity, in my opinion, if you had a men's team doing really well and a women's team doing really well, the kind of excitement that, that brings around everyone and, and the way that it pushes each team to be successful is something that is quite new to me but something I've really enjoyed so hopefully this year especially if kind of things can settle down and more people are allowed into stadiums and stuff it yeah. should be really good fun to get the kind of the town here and make our kind of northern fortress a bit difficult for those big teams down south to come and play at yeah that'd be awesome it'd be amazing if we if, we, if COVID allows us we'll try and make a, a pint yeah. of pint trip out to a game <laughs> that'd be brilliant that'd be great <laughs> So I think it's worth mentioning as well, at the end of the season, you was also awarded Goalkeeper of the Year over, was it all of the Division 2 teams as well, weren't it? Yeah. So, I mean, that was something that I didn't really expect. We had a great run in terms of clean sheets. I think the 11 games that we played when I was there, we kept eight clean sheets, but we kept six back-to-back to win the league because of the way, it's probably the first team that I've been in where, I know it's a cliche, but every single player gave as much defensively as they did in attack. And as a goalkeeper, I've only been, I've only seen it where, well, not only seen it, but I've seen it very often where teams are not like that and it leaves you very exposed and it's very difficult. Everyone loves to attack and then suddenly when we need to defend, no one's there, which can be a little bit difficult. <laughs> but this, this team, every single player, including our number nine, who was top goal scorer in the whole league, yeah. defended just as much as, as anyone else. So, I thought that we'd have a good chance for, for us to win that award for our league. Cause I mean, as goalkeeper of the year, my team has helped me a lot with that, but to then be, to then be voted to win that for all the division twos was kind of something that I didn't expect, especially having been there only from, from the summer. So 
I was um, yeah pleasantly surprised when in lockdown number two in my kitchen that news came through. So that was that was a nice boost at that point. Real. Amazing. So what award did you get for that? Was that like a golden dip tie as well? Or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I'd love a pair of the golden gloves if they want to send that across. That yeah, that'd be class. Out. But um, yeah, no no golden tie unfortunately for that. <laughs> no, no, only only bragging rights. <laughs> Brilliant. So, last thing that I've got then before we go over to a little like a Tommy Lee Pro Five quiz, if that's all right, mm. is do you have ambition to come and play in in England, or are you quite enjoying sort of travelling around different countries and sort of getting quite a lot of experience out abroad? Yeah, I, I do. I think. I mean, <laughs> and my girlfriend always says to me that she'll she'll love it when we're in one place for a sustained period of time, and she knows where she's going to be living. So I think. <laughs> that's something which I mean for all that she's been through with me that would be nice for her as well but I'd love to come back and play in in England or the UK or, or wherever I think like I said to you especially growing up as a as a smaller goalkeeper it worked against me a lot of times in terms of the opportunities that you'd get and and I was told a lot as a kid oh you're not big enough to be a keeper you're not big enough to be a pro and, and in the beginning I, I, I was disheartened by that but getting older seeing people like Casillas and, and, and Valdez and all these keepers and, and even now looking in the Premier League, people like Matty Ryan is changing. And for me, I wanted to make sure that I kept developing and kept learning so that when that opportunity came where it wasn't a factor anymore and it was more about my performance rather than height, I was ready to take it. And for me, it felt that if I could go and play higher level abroad and keep progressing abroad, building my reputation the opportunity would come where I could slot back in at those higher levels in the UK. <clears throat> I felt that that was more um, attainable in terms of coming back at that level than trying to work my way through non-league, which yeah. was which was an option and a lot an option that a lot of lads have taken. And it just didn't seem that in terms of development and learning and, and progression, I felt I could do more by playing abroad and and. I feel like it was the right decision from the things that I've learned in playing in Spain, playing in Gibraltar, playing in Sweden. Now, the progression that I felt as a keeper individually and also in terms of the level that I'm playing at, I'm getting there. And I hope that in a couple of years or whenever that opportunity comes to come back to the UK, I can slot back in at that high level that I've always wanted to play at. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and... Keep, keeper's careers do tend to go on a bit longer, in don't they? Anyway, so there's no, no, no huge rush, and I think no. building all this experience is it's a great thing. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, my dad always said to me, if you can, if you're the best goalkeeper, you'll play at the best level. So it's about mm -hmm. learning, it's about getting better, and and if I can learn and get better every single year, then I'll get where I want to go. So it's about finding those opportunities that are going to teach me and help me to improve. And the success your club's having as well. And, you, you know, that's only going to put you in good stead because you, you obviously you're getting accolades, your team's proven itself. You've got a new level, a new stage to perform on now. I think yeah. it's great. It, like you say, I'm sure the option is there to go into non-league when, um, you know, when you're looking for a club and everything. But I imagine that's even tougher when you're a goalkeeper because, I mean, it goes without saying, there's only one number one. Um mm. And then a two and a three, obviously. But I'm saying, in terms of getting noticed and everything, non-league level, it, you're, at a, you're at a disadvantage to begin with as a goalkeeper in terms of getting noticed. I guess uh, is what I've always perceived it. Just because you do need to become the number one. Um, so I think it's fantastic. I, I mean, I know nothing about <laughs> what the best route of a career is, but putting yourself out there, getting games, that's got to be better than biding your time for potentially forever yeah I am um, I mean you're spot on it I I'm fortunate now that because of the stuff that we've done with with YouTube and things I get younger goalkeepers asking questions and, and asking for advice on stuff and I say to all of them you need to play like whatever age you are you need to play if you're going to learn you need to be playing games because as good as training is nothing can replicate the games and especially as a younger keeper even if it's a level two levels three levels below what you think you are Go and play because the ones that don't and the ones that sit there and just do the training or sit on the bench like I did at Macclesfield takes you nowhere, doesn't develop you. So from then, if you can go out and play every single game, prove yourself as a goalkeeper, like you say, build that reputation, 
it builds confidence too. And, and as a goalkeeper, confidence is massive. So if you can keep playing those games, keep progressing, any young keeper, whatever level, whatever age, just make sure you're playing and learning. Yeah. Right, Josh, I'll let you take him through the quiz. Yeah, so uh, we, we do this with, with all of our guests, Connor. Uh, so it's called yeah. the, the Tommy Pro 5 quiz. Um, so Tommy, former Chesterfield goalkeeper, was the first of our, our guests to get five out of five. Uh, so he, Goal, he earned Goalkeeper. Name. Yeah, goalkeeper. goalkeeper. That's it, goalkeeper's union. <laughs> Smart, smartest players on the pitch. <laughs> so we're expecting you to get five out of five yeah, and keep the moment. Up, <laughs> are you, are you going to rename it? Make it the Tommy and Connor quiz? Um, get five. <laughs> I'll have to get Tommy's permission. Tommy Lee chips in for uh, Christmas do, Connor, so there's all the... <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with them. Um, I mean, you've already answered number one when we've been talking, so it's a nice, nice, easy one for you to, to get started. So, you joined Pitya in July 2020 and went on to win the title. You were voted Sweden Division Two Goalkeeper of the Year. In 11 matches, how many clean sheets did you keep? Six, seven, or eight? Eight. <laughs> it was eight. And, and just what a run <laughs> that is. To, yeah. to, 11 games, eight, 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 eight clean sheets. <laughs> The, the, the one that killed me was we, we conceded six goals and four of them were penalties. So I'm absolutely gutted because normally I'm good at saving pens, but in the league, I can see I saved none out of four. So I was almost more annoyed about that than I was pleased about the eight clean sheets out of eleven. Uh, I mean, that's, that's got to set you up for a title run when you're keeping eight clean sheets out of eleven. You're not going to be far off, are you? Again, so, yeah, no, brilliant. brilliant. Um, so number two, uh, we're going to touch on your YouTube um, channel now. So you started your hugely successful YouTube series, Keeping Goals, a few years ago. Yes. Can you remember the date of your first Keeping Goals episode when it went live? Was it the 18th of September 2017, the 18th of October 2017, or the 18th of November 2017? Um, I am tempted to say 18th of September 2017. It was October, 1820. Oh. Yeah, it's um, you, channel, it a bit of a tricky one, Max. Your channel started a bit earlier, and then I think Keeping Goals was like your, your fourth or fifth video. video yeah. on there. And what a, a great job you're doing on there, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, and staying on that subject, in Keeping Goals episode six, you travel to the Bernabeu with Fennel Labrada. Uh, you earn an extraordinary 2-2 draw with Real Madrid. Who scored Fennel Labrada's 89th minute equaliser? <laughs> <laughs> were, you too, were you too busy looking at Bale? <laughs> <laughs> it, never gets, it never gets old when they go head in hand. I, I, can, I can tell you how, what he looks like. I can, <laughs> tell you, I can tell you what the goal is. And I mean, I highly doubt that he'll be listening to this because he can't speak English, but I can barely remember the guy's name. And um, I want to say, I want to say like Javi or Juan or something like that, but... Uh, I, I think know. we need to give initials maybe, Josh. It, okay, okay. Okay. I want to say like J, JB or JR or something like that, but I can't, is, is uh, it, I can't say. His initials are AP. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm going through Spanish A's in my head. Um, I, I, I can't, I don't know. Alvaro Matia. Alvaro, I'm sorry, Alvaro. Lo <laughs> siento mucho, mi amigo. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, the first goal actually at the Bernabeu, what a strike that was. I can tell you who that was. That was Luis Mia. Why didn't you ask me that one? <laughs> I can tell you who that was. That were a bully. We we're about 25 yard out, straight straight to roof at net, I think. But yeah, I know. Off the bar and in as well. Yeah. They're always better, aren't they, off the bar? They are. Yeah. It does always make it look better. Yeah. Yeah. Hearing it that it pick off a bar. As well. I always think that makes it all look better. If it goes in top corner and keep it up, move. I know, I know. I'm so <laughs> gutted I can't remember his name. <laughs> I think you're safe. I don't think you'll be watching. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> we get tweeted by Alvaro next week, though. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll add you into the. <laughs> It'll be fuming. <laughs> um, so question four. Uh, your most watched YouTube video is from around a year ago, season two, episode 34, which is a trial in front of Pro Scouts. Hmm. To the nearest 10,000, because there are that many views on it, 
how many views does that video have? And I will, I'll give you 10,000 either side because it's a ridiculous number. <laughs> Bear in mind, we celebrate when we get over 100. <laughs> Apparently we're, like, we're constantly about 300 now, actually. Not bad this, for three I did look at this the other day because I was thinking it's quite, it, it's either just gone through or it's near to a third of a mil. So it's around 330 thousand so uh, i'm gonna say yeah three hundred and thirty thousand. i gave you ten thousand either side and you got it spot on three hundred and thirty thousand. Nice. unbelievable nice. is, is that something uh, you're, you're loving doing connor obviously i'm really enjoying it and i hope people don't take it the wrong way that i remember that number and not the name of my teammate <laughs> but, <laughs> but like it's it's something that i love doing it's something that I set up with my one of my best mates from uni who is unbelievable kind of video editor, storyteller and it was something that we always wanted to do because uh, I mean you see so many like big films like the, the Ronaldo film or the McGregor film and it's amazing to see where they've come from and what they've done but you know that they make it so that kind of whole thing with Keeping Goals was we're going to document my attempt at trying to play at the highest level but I don't know if I'm going to make it you don't know if I'm going to make it but I'm going to be completely honest with every up and every down along the way and hopefully that can give other people value and can help them with their own journeys whether they're goalkeepers or whether they're something completely yeah. different I, I just hope it can bring people value in terms of honestly documenting the journey of what I'm trying to do and, and, and where it's going to go so it's been something that I've really enjoyed doing and we haven't done it for the views or the subs it was never important even though I remember the number but <laughs> it was it was something that I'm really glad that people are taking value from and, and that it and that it helps other goalkeepers of all ages because if I was a kid it was something that I would have loved to see to see yeah, yeah. someone playing abroad someone showing what it's really like not just the the oh this is amazing I'm at the Bernabeu but yeah. also the when you're injured when you're in bad form when you've conceded five goals because that's the reality of, of of life let alone goalkeeping it's not on social media now you so often you just see highlights of all the best bits and, and that's a whole other conversation but hopefully with what we're doing we're showing what it is actually like to keep trying to progress towards towards a goal so no i, I really do enjoy it it, it is it, it is amazing, amazing. As you talk about as a kid, would you'd have enjoyed it? I think as a kid, does that, have any of you ever seen the film Goal about this? Yes. Yeah. I loved San, that. Santiago Nunes. I know Santiago his name. Santiago Nunes. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that, and you just think, obviously, it's an entirely unrealistic movie. Um, putting that aside, it's just a bit of fun, isn't it? But you think your story, you know, see how it progresses over the next year. He's crying out for a screenplay, is that, isn't it? Golden letters being said. <laughs> Golden hearts. <laughs> Golden hearts. Yeah, that's a nice link. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, you say that. <laughs> and then Miguel Almiron basically lived, lived the goal, lived goal out to be, yeah, to be a fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not bad as well when you've got Ben Foster sort of mimicking sort of what you do as well, isn't it? <laughs> he's he's taking it to a whole other level as well, by the way. Oh, what what a guy! I mean, like I've really enjoyed watching his stuff, and I mean, I, I could talk about Foster for ages because I just feel his approach to goalkeeping and, and football oh, in general is is brilliant. The way his mental state is and, and how he just takes everything as it comes, gives his best, doesn't get beaten up or down about things going wrong. In, including Jamal's celebration in his latest video, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, just, he's just a great guy. Yeah. yeah, I love his bike stuff as well. He's getting a new bike every few weeks. I'm so jealous. Yeah, it's all right, isn't it? I mean, so fair, I'm really, I'm really, <laughs> at least it's not Ferraris and Lamborghinis. Yeah, 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 it's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Right. Question five. Um, as mentioned, won the league with Pitya, final day of the season. Uh, you finished the season with six straight clean sheets in that, in that run of eight. Uh, the last league goal you conceded was on the 3rd of September 2020. And I think this is still now because you've not played since. So, I mean, you've not conceded a goal for many months. Um, who was that against? <laughs> that was a penalty shock. Away, <laughs> away at Celestia. 
I think, was our last goal that we conceded. Yeah, and I'm glad you got it right so I didn't have to pronounce it. <laughs> I mean, the, the most annoying thing about that is, well, not annoying. The fact, it was the only game we lost all season. We yeah. lost 1-0 after, after dominating the game to a penalty in the first half. And, I mean, everyone knows it from fans to players, that feeling of, battering teams and just not getting a goal when you're one nil down. I don't I think they only got out of the half once in the second half. They had one shot on target, which was a penalty, and they won one nil. So yeah. daylight robbery. But and the it, the, the annoying thing was we my first game with PT my my friend uh, my debut was a friendly against Sheleftia at that ground. I, I kept a clean sheet, got man of the match, saved a penalty. And the, the penalty was in the same goal and I was like, he won't go the same way. It'll go the other way. And he put it the exact same place and I dived the other way. No. So I was, I was like, why didn't you just do what you did last time and you just, you just saved it? So um, yeah, It's such it was... a mental game, in it? Penalties. Because I, yeah. I play Sunday League, it's nothing fancy in that, but it's just such a mental game. You're like, oh, he's walking up to the ball a bit cocky. He's going to go on this <laughs> side or something. And, and that's what it is because I'm not quite at the level where you get clips sent to you of every player's penalty that they've taken in the last yeah. hundred years of yeah. whatever they get in the Premier League. So for me, a lot of it is stealth research in terms of trying to find everything I can if penalties go in, who took them, where they were, what they did with them. But also, like you say, a psychological kind of evaluation of the type of player, what foot they use, whether they prefer to kind of finesse things or smash things, like what time of the game it is, do they need to score, are they under pressure? And all these different factors that you're trying to evaluate in your head to then create the decision of which way you're going to go as a goalkeeper. So I think when you're not quite at the level where everything gets sent to you on your iPad to watch before the game, it's a really uh, kind of back to basics form of the game in that cat and mouse between a striker and a, and a keeper, which normally I'm really good at and I enjoy, but last season, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> From a keeper's perspective, this to you and Nick, I suppose, but... I mean, as a player, I shit myself, pardon my French, if a left footer steps up for my, for my club, for Burnley. If I see if I see a left footer in a shootout, um, I'm like, oh, just, no, go away. Um, what's a keeper's perspective on it? Because I don't know if the stats back up my thoughts, but they are crap at penalties. <laughs> well, Nick, have you got any experience? <laughs> No, nah, not really. Unless it's no. someone like Ian Hart, who was an absolute penalty machine back in the day, but... No, not really. No, no. I, it's just the way they run up. It's like the telegraph, which side they're going to go in more than a right footer. And I, 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 but from a keeper's point of view, I wonder if that's different. As I think left, left, left footers, footers, left footers are a little bit odd. Anyway, we all know that it's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit weird. But the the, <laughs> the the kind of yeah, it's a bit of more unpredictability where you have no idea where it's going to go. But um, I can't say I've had any major experience of the being terrible. <laughs> There's a there's a little lad oh, at Barcelona, a little Argentinian lad at Barcelona who's all right at penalties. I think he's left footed. Yeah. <laughs> a bit weird and all, isn't it? <laughs> a bit weird. Uh, a little bit, a little bit unusual. <laughs> Certainly, Connor. Thank you so much for your time. You've been an absolute gem and an amazing story, which we will all follow on uh, on your YouTube channel. But thank you no. so much for giving us your time. It's, Not it's at all. Amazing. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been been great fun. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Best of luck. Best Thank you. The season ahead. Thanks, guys. And like like you say, if if you ever want to come out, let me know. We'll we'll get a a pie and pint VIP corner going on it. Oh, I love it. I can't wait. We've got to now. <laughs> come on, Boris. Fix the country. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go, <out>, Boris. <laughs> Cheers, Cheers mate. Thanks, guys. See you bye. later. Bye. 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 Welcome back. Wasn't Connor a top lad? Make sure you go and check out his YouTube channel, which we will leave in the link in the description. But make sure you're also subscribing to Pine of Pine, because a lot of you aren't, and it's depressing. So <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> right, let's get on with this week's fixtures. So looking back at last week's, Luke, take us through Burnley's FA Cup win against Fulham. Absolutely smashed him. 3-0 was... In, it was only flattering to one team, and that's Fulham. It was a <laughs> demolition job, honestly, with a second string out, really. We only had McNeil um, and Tarky played. Other than that, it was second second string, and it just showed, you know, 
we've got a decent squad when I, when when they can be bothered in uh, the cup, which isn't usual. I thought we'd lose, but at it from the off, really good goals. Rodriguez and Vidra were great. Jack Cork and Dale Stevens, really good in midfield. Just a great performance. Yeah, we get a lot of stick to Dale, Dale Stevens, haven't we? <laughs> He were really good. I mean, he weren't fit apparently when he joined. He, didn't, he hadn't played for months. But um, it was really good to see Jack Cork back as well, who um, we have missed. Brownhill's a good player, but I do think Cork's a bit just a stronger player, frankly. I think we have missed him. Um, he's a composure on the ball. And it made the difference the other day against Villa when Brownhill got subbed for Cork. He did change the game. Yeah. Well, we all got no points for that game, but Josh. Brilliant win, 3-2 against Liverpool. What happened? Yeah, um, completely different from the league game, which were sort of both teams just trying to suss each other out, United sitting deep. It just went for it, which I don't know why we don't do more because we've got the attack to do it. Um, strange, but yeah, good win. Two games in a week against Liverpool and didn't lose. Yeah, it's not, not bad, is it? No. But yeah, then we ruined it. Ruined season by losing to an absolute shower of shit. Yeah. <laughs> hey, not Sheffield United, definitely not Sheffield United. But uh, right, yeah, and then good. we also got no points for that one, so it just shows how good we uh, we are <laughs> predicting. And then Derby versus QPR, one one nil. I got five points. We didn't deserve it. I'll be honest, we didn't deserve it. Who cares? Fuck them. Yeah. yeah. We didn't deserve it, but we held on for a 1-0 win and I was very, very happy. So, right, we'll get on to this week's and Luke, we'll start with you. Derby versus Bristol City. 1-0 uh, Derby, because Bristol City seem a bit hit and miss. and We don't score more than one goal. They don't need to, as proven by Burnley. What am I saying? We're free scoring now. <laughs> <laughs> free scoring. Um, who? Derby, Bristol City. Oh, Derby and Bristol City. Um, Bristol, they beat Huddersfield, but they were hanging on from what I, I heard on um, Soccer Saturday or whatever it is in midweek. Uh, I think you'll win 2-1. Yeah, I'm not sure it'll be Soccer Saturday midweek, mate. Just no, mid <laughs> midweek. So soccer midweek. Soccer Wednesday. Midweek. Right, Derby, Bristol City, I'm going to say... The same as Luke, 1 0 Derby. Arsenal, Man United, Josh. Oh, God. I'm not looking forward to it. I, I hate them. Oh. I know what Luke's score is going to be. Hey, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I don't know because the result against Sheffield United will go one or two ways. United have, in recent history, um, been on a really good run. Then we'll have a wobble. But it won't just be one game. It'll go on for a month or so. Solskjaer will be close to getting sacked. And then we'll turn <laughs> to find Barca again. Um, so I, I expect that to continue. I hope it doesn't. But I, yeah, I think Arsenal 2-0. Cool. Right, I'm going to go with a 0-0. What, what are you going with, Luke? <laughs> Absolute 0-0. All day. Every day. <laughs> Every day, 0-0. Chelsea Burnley. So I'm going to start us off. Tuchel, second game in charge. 1 1. Couldn't call it. What do you think, Luke? I don't think we'll lose. I don't know why, really, because they should destroy us. But we've done all right at Stamford Bridge, generally. We've won there. We've had a few draws. Um, I didn't really see anything. I can't judge him on one game, like, obviously, but. You know, it made me laugh. The Chelsea Twitter account putting out this positive post after a nil-nil draw at home. Oh, 808 was. passes. Wasn't this amazing? Yeah. Not really. <laughs> Is it? Let's be honest. It's not It's not amazing at all. Just like their entire season and the waste of money that Lampard did. Um, <laughs> end of day, if we win, we're about three points behind them. So, it's a mid-table duel. Um I don't think we'll lose, but I'm not certain. I don't think we'll win. I'll say one all. Hey, we've got no. to the same scores all the way through here. Yeah. Hashtag pray for Josh. Um, they'll do exactly what they did to Wolves because Burnley would be delighted. I'd imagine with a nil-nil. 
Yeah. Um, so they'll they'll sit with sort of two banks of four and say to Chelsea, come and break us down. Um, so they'll have about a thousand passes this time. They might even up. Um, I do think I think Chelsea will win, um, but it won't be it won't be easy. It'll be close. I think it'll just be one nil. All right, thank you very much. This has been Pine Pine. Make sure you join us next week for Tom White. We'll see you then. That's good news. Deadline day. Breaking news. Tom White in for me. <laughs> <laughs> see you then. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Pie and a pine. Pie and a pine. Pie and a pine. Pie.